every time we see a potentially transforming technology that could affect work, right? So we see that back in the days, in Industrial Revolution, the Luddites movement, right? There were these people who literally burned the looms, and、uh, it didn't. Turns out that you know having these、uh, looms that effectively accelerates the process of making garments. Did not make these people lose their jobs. We actually see an increase in employment. So every time we see technology that could potentially, you know, change the way we work, change our lives, we I think there's like a human visceral reaction to it. Welcome to the Ripple Effect, the podcast that takes you on a journey through the minds of work and faculty. I'm your host Dan Loney, and in each episode, we'll be diving deep into the inspiration behind the groundbreaking research that. Wharton professors have conducted, and exploring how their findings resonate with the world today. We'll be covering a diverse range of topics, bringing you the latest insights and knowledge that you can apply to your life and to work. So get ready to dive into new ideas with the Ripple Effect. And a pleasure to be joined by Lin Wu, who's associate professor of operations, information, and decisions here at the Wharton School. Lin, great to talk to you again. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, and I guess let's start out by what it was that has kind of originally sparked your interest in studying how kind of robots are are starting to change employment. That's a great question. Honestly, this one has the easiest motivation. At the time, there I mean, still going on now. There were just so many articles on the press and academia or everywhere about how robots are going to take over all our jobs and the、uh, pending robocalypse that's going to happen very soon. And、uh, there, are, there were already policy pieces on robot taxes. You know,、uh, you had one. Bill Gates promoted it. Bill de Blasio made it a central piece of the presidential campaign back in 2000, 2020. And the Bernie Sanders recently had also proposed some kind of a robot tax.、Uh, so I, I think it's really important to understand what's going on here. Like, have some real concrete evidence. At the firm level, to see whether firm actually do lay off people on mass after robot adoption, and、uh, there were only industry and the country level evidence at the time, and it's actually really important to study at the firm level because you know countries and industries do not adopt robots, firms do, right?、Mm -hmm. And、uh, whatever the positive negative facts you find depends on you know whether firms、uh, that adopt. Actually, off people where they, you know, where it's actually coming from, firm that do not adopt. So this kind of a, you know, this kind of effects are very difficult to observe in, when you're looking at a macro level at the industry and country level. Why is it? Do you think we've kind of had these narratives pop up, and 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 really, in many cases,、uh, they have taken hold、uh, in with some people over the last few years. I think it's、uh, not just last few years. Like I think that I've seen this kind of trends. Going on, like every time we see a potentially transforming technology that could affect work, right? So we see that back in the days, in Industrial Revolution, the Luddites movement, right? There were these people who literally burned the looms that actually automated the process of making,、uh, you know, garments. And、uh, it didn't. Turns out that you know having these、uh, looms that effectively accelerates the process of making garments. Did not make these people lose their jobs. We actually see an increase in employment for people who can effectively use these new automated to,、uh, mechanical tools like, like looms. And you know, we see the same thing with like,、uh, you know, Excel. Excel is like it's going to take is going to replace accountants. It never happened, right? So every、yeah. time we see a technology that could potentially, you know, change the way we work, change our lives, and we, I think there's like a human. Visual reaction to it, and especially we tend to overestimate what the technology can do, and thinking, "Oh my gosh, I'm going to lose my jobs now." And I think it's really important to take back to think about what exactly is that technology doing before, you know, we make any strong decisions, especially the policymakers,、uh, you know, at、uh, uh, a policy angle to decide, you know, what are we going to do about this? What are, what are, what are workers going to do about?、It? What are firms going to do about it? So tell us a little bit about the research that you're doing in this area to try and really get a better grasp on what's what's、uh, been taking place here. Yeah, absolutely. So our work is a first to study robot adoption on employment, how the effects going、uh, is going to be at the firm level. 
So I want to emphasize at the firm level is because only at a firm you can see what happens when firm adopt robots. Do they actually off people or do they actually hire more people? And what happened to the firm that did not adopt? Right. So these kind of uh, effects can only be observed at the more micro level. So we actually use the data from uh, Statistical Canada, which has a comprehensive data on uh, robot import and export. So which have a very good measure of robot uh, adoption data. And we also have very comprehensive data about their financial performance from, from the tax uh, filings and a bunch of, uh, uh, you know, mandatory surveys that the Canadian government mandated on uh, uh, various firm practices. So what we found is exactly somewhat opposite of what people were expecting that robot did not replace human workers. In fact, the robot adopters or the firm that adopted robots hired more people than they did before. So how do we reconcile the evidence that we see sometimes at industry level and country level, there is a negative effect on robots unemployment. It turns out it's not the robot adopting firms that are hurting employment. It is a firm that did not adopt robots that are losing the competition. They're not competitive as before and they had to lay off people because they're losing the market share. So it's a very different story than the popular press thinking that we got to tax robots to preserve human work. It turns out is the, the people, the firm that did not adopt robots need help. So taxing the firm that adopt robots or turned out to be exactly wrong thing to do in this case. That's, so that's like a one major finding in, 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 in saying, in basically saying, well, look, we have to look at these phenomena in a greater detail to understand what's going on here without this kind of a firm level measurement and, and the technology measurement, we wouldn't be able to know this important distinction. We also have found other effects on employment. It's not the number that matters. So we always think that robots are, you know, taking over our jobs and uh, that's not, that's not the case, but it turns out that the story is not as rosy as we had expected. Right. So we actually see the skill effects, basically the effect of robot on different type of skills has a very different, has a different story. So specifically robot adopting firms hired more high skill workers and many more low skill workers at the expense of middle skilled workers. Hmm. So here I define high skill workers are those with college education. Low skill workers are, are the people with barely finished high school and uh, middle skill workers are people with high school degrees, but with kind of where associate degrees has some kind of a more advanced work related trainings. So is this middle skill workers are being decimated by robot and that is a big problem. And we also show that not only that managerial work, supervisory work has also been decimated by robots. So. If you look at the average number, it looks great. Like employment has gone up, but by hollowing out the middle skill work, hollowing out the supervisory work is actually a big problem because now the career ladder is broken, right? right. So how do we incentivize? How do we train? How do we make sure, uh, you know, where did middle skill work go? They can't, I mean, you can't expect people to all get college degrees and become, you know, programmers or become robot technicians, right? Or, you know, producers, right? <laughs> And does it's, it's, yeah same thing with low skill yeah do, does the adoption of robots in the firms that you see uh that have done that mm -hmm. does it change the dynamics of the work being done by those companies not even necessarily the labor side of it but actually the the actual work and maybe even the success rate for the company itself absolutely so let me give you an example like so I think you touch on a very important question is what, like, you know, it's just adopting the robot itself is not going to be enough, right? You have to be able to learn how to manage robots in a way that accelerates your performance, it increase your worker productivity. So let me give you an example, a real life example. It's like a repair facility at a U.S. Uh, electronic firm. They actually experience a dramatic improvement in their ability to observe productivity after robots were implemented okay so this is a repair facility they fix electronics okay 
And be, you know, because robots do, don't get tired, they don't get physically tired when performing this kind of repetitive task of, of you know, of fixing certain uh, errors, certain problems in the, in the electron, electronic board. So they can do this job more consistently than humans who are previously doing the same task. And as a result, the variance in production actually have gone down. So this allowed manager to clearly observe individual employees' behaviors. And they actually found that, you know, through this, just because robots are doing these kind of tasks, they were able to see, oh, many employees, so human employees were following a regular pattern of being very productive in the morning compared to the afternoon. And in the afternoon, their productivity kind of went down a little bit. And, but then they do more repairs in later hours as they were like, you know, cramming their work at the end of the days. So interestingly, after robots are implementing the repairing process, right? they are actually able to track this individual employee's productivity um, for easier for two reasons, right? First, the type of errors the robots made are very different from that of humans, okay? So because of the di differentiating errors between humans and the robots, it's make it easier for us to figure out which one is which, okay? And robots are also more likely to make consistent errors compared to human errors, right? Again, making human errors easier to identify. Okay. Another reason is that robots also pr provide a precise data about their own performance, okay? which also made it easier to isolate both positive and negative side of uh, performance changes caused by human behaviors. So this data generating capability allowed manager to you know, monitor pro their productivity much better than before, detect weaknesses in the, pr in the production processes. And then so just not just adopting robot itself, it's all the other things they've done to detect it, figure out in the production, production process. In this case, the manager of the referred facility wasn't even aware of this cramming behavior described earlier until the robots were able to monitor and adopt, uh, after they adopt a robot to, uh, to observe these, uh, these uh, processes. And as a result, they were changing lots of the work processes along the way to further reduce the errors uh, once human, or work, human workers and robots are working together. And overall, error rates in our facility has dramatically improved. This is an example of where robots how robots can be used to improve productivity in human, uh, uh, how, to, how, how to manage workforce appropriately to capture, to further increase effect of the robots. How do you think that then careers uh, are gonna be impacted by the further adoption of robots? And, and I'll play that off of uh, the comment you made earlier about the impact being uh, significant on middle managers as we go forward. You would think that's, a, that's an important kind of stepping stone in a person's professional career, if we have fewer of those, then that changes, I think, the the hierarchy, the structure of leadership within companies. That's a really, really important point. And it's actually a really hard problem to solve. So in my research, I mentioned earlier, because you have many more lower skill workers and many more higher skill workers at, at expense of middle skill work, the type of manager you need it's going to be very different, right? These managers need to understand how a robot works to be able to detect its processes. Just, just, I, just like the example I gave about repair facilities, right? They need to change fundamentally change the way they work, fundamentally change the, the way they monitor and reward and hire employees, right? So these are so there are two effects. Number one, we we simply need fewer managers than before, supervisors before, because managing standardized work and lower skill worker is you can manage many. At, a t at the same time, as opposed to higher skill or middle skill workers, right? And furthermore, the type of manager skill, management skills you need is going to be different, right? So it's a big problem, right? So now I, so now we have no middle skill work, what less of them, and much fewer supervisory work. And where do people go, right? So middle, so the entry level work is supposed to be a stepping stone, as you said, to move up in the career hierarchy. And now you can't move up anymore, right? You got middle skill right. and you're gone. You go to uh, the supervisors and you are gone. And then you, you can't, it's very hard to move up to high skill work, right? That requires right. extensive training. So this is a very big challenge for managers, right? You have to think about, well, how do I build a new career ladder for my employees now? The existing one may not work. It, it, may, it, it may not have worked already. And, uh, that's why you see lots of unionization going on in the workforce, right. from Amazon warehouse to Starbucks everywhere. It's because that you cannot, you can't use a career ladder as a motivating force 
for people to, you know, work an entry level job at lower pay in, in exchange for future career advancements. So how do you build that back? You know, if you don't, if firms do not build it back, then we're, we're going to see union becoming, uh, you know, a, a more mainstay in our in, in our society again. So if we're expecting that we're going to see more companies uh, adding robotics uh, mm -hmm. into their operational structure here in the years ahead, I, I guess, does it answer the question whether or not companies can even avoid having robots in the first place? It almost seems a little bit like they can't afford to do that a as we move farther down the road. Yeah, at, at this at this case, unless there's no one adopting a technology, the moment one per, one firm adopts, they become more effective, more competitive. That means everyone else, in order to stay competitive in the market space, in marketplace, you have to adopt these new technologies, right? Like it just uh, even the biggest firms, like you know, um, very profitable, very, you know, you know, very you know, innovative firms have to catch up on that game. And we've seen that, you know, Google's case when uh, Microsoft released ChatGPT, Google scrambling to do the same thing, in, in, in incorporating every aspect of that technology in their, in their products. Like that's just something that fir uh, firms just cannot avoid, uh, you know, just uh, burning the ludites, right? The ludites right. burning the looms, not going to work. In this case. Yeah. <laughs> how, then, <laughs> yeah. how then do you think that uh, the advancement of ChatGPT will play a role uh, in the corporate uh, uh, corporate structure as we move forward. Oh, I think uh, you know the robot thing is a tip of iceberg. The ChatGPT large and large language model is going to accelerate that process tremendously, because you think about what ChatGPT and the large language models, you know, what they are targeting is exactly that middle skill work. Right. It's not like it's, it's entry level work like you feel like, you know, and uh, that that will be replaced. And then because these technology are really good when you already know when you are an expert in that field already it accelerates your work. But who are doing those work for you before? If you were, you know, a senior person is people below you. Now you can use the chat GPT to do a lot of it for you. So it's precisely yeah. that middle skill work that is being targeted. And that's exactly, you know, it's the same effect of robots. I, uh, there was like a recent paper by OpenAI and also our colleagues at Wharton that showed that the, 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 the skill set that's being targeted at GPT is programming jobs. Again, middle skill programming jobs and right. writers, writing jobs. Again, those are, you know, entry level writing jobs. So those are being, you know, being massively accelerated by the chat GPT. So is the, is the middle skill job uh, does its uh, longer-term uh, outlook look very bleak at this point, or is there going to be some level of middle skill work that will still be there in conjunction with all of this advancement around technology? I think existing middle skill work is in trouble, but new middle skill work will be created. For example, right, prompt engineering, something you've never heard of until maybe it's a few months ago. These, are, these engineers are literally trying to make ChatGPT do what it's supposed to do, right? Prompt engineering, or ro robot technicians to fix the robots, right? right. Process right. engineering to fig observe processes to see where robots can be used in the production processes, right? All these things are, you know, probably going to be new tasks. And then over time, those ta new tasks will evolve into new career opportunities. Just like, you know, 20 years ago, there was no social media manager, right? Like, that's a yeah. new job that created as a result of the technologies. But, but the important problem is not necessarily the new job will be created. I guarantee you that new jobs and new tasks will be created. Is the speed at which we can retrain the existing workforce to actually leverage that, right? The last time we had this kind of dramatic technology change is probably industrial revolution, um, steam engine repl being replaced by electricity. That took 30, 40 years to complete. Right, and that means a new generation of managers retired, new gener sorry, the existing like uh, you know the existing managers to retire, existing workforce to retire, for new managers and new workforce who are already you know being trained in the kind of technology to work effectively. Except in this time, we're not going to have 30, 40 years horizon. We're going to have five, 10 years horizon. So how do you re retrain that existing workforce? is going to be a huge challenge for everyone, for firms, for policymakers, for, for everyone. Yeah. 
thank you for listening to The Ripple Effect. We hope you found this episode informative and engaging. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review so that we can continue to bring you the best insight from the Wharton School.